let's pull back together here and uh, and and uh, continue with uh, Sasa in the office. Um, just went to check. I went to check something over break to uh, respond also to uh, uh, Brother Peter's uh, a question about uh, uh, Sasa's understanding of Kirk and Gemeinde. Um, there is one place in this um, uh, this this essay here uh, where he. Um, um, takes up um, uh, uh, takes up this question, and um, he says it will always remain the criterion for a concept of the evangelical Lutheran Church and of the ministry, whether one agrees with Luther here or not. Uh, that in the case of necessity, the congregation Gemeinde can appoint its own office bearer. And in fact, so far as I know, no Lutheran theologian has ever opposed Luther on this question. August Vilmar himself, the proponent of an expressly high church view of the office, emphatically agreed with Luther, even though he regarded the cases of Christians in the wilderness a fictitious borderline case. Uh, here, Sasa is referring to the Luther's letter to the Bohemians. Uh, if we don't have a pastor, no pastor to ordain, can the congregation uh, itself uh, call and ordain, and Luther says yes, and and that, um, and, and Sasa reaffirms that, but he, you know, and, and says even August Wilmar, who was arguably the most, quote, high church, feel, page 133 in Lonely Way, but again, uh, Sasa, I think, also agrees with Wilmar that we ought not, uh, we ought not establish doctrine on so-called borderline cases, you know, uh, that which is, uh, again, in some of the current debates in the Missouri Synod, you'll have these passages of Luther pulled out of their context. Uh, Luther is not talking about a congregation that is uh, inconvenient, but he's talking about a political situation where you have a congregation of Christians who are simply uh, cut off from the, off from, from the ministry. And, and rather than they, the congregation going without the ministry, they, they call and ordain a man from their own midst to, to preach and to administer the sacraments. And um, uh, that's quite different from the way that uh, we talk about you know, these extraordinary or emergency situations today. Uh, Always, when we talk, uh, when we use the language, you know, people talk about ex uh, emergency situations often, um, and I can't put my finger on where Sasa uses this language um, offhand. But at one point, Sasa says something to the effect that in the vocabulary of the church, emergency situations are matters of life and death. And that the old rule in the church was an emergency knows no no rule. In other words, if you think of it, uh, you're traveling, you know, down I-40 and you see an accident, and you're not trained as a physician, and yet if you don't provide some kind of medical care, this guy's going to die. And so, even though it's not your your training or your opt even to be a emergency medical worker, you stop and do what you can. But it's it's a life and death situation. It doesn't mean that then because you save this guy's life, you can go around being an emergency medical you know, worker. Uh, and, and one of the difficulties that I think we've kind of brought upon ourselves in the Missouri Synod is that we have used exceptional or emergency situations then as normative. And Sasa corrects that kind of language when he says emergencies are always matters of life and death. And once the crisis is passed, the emergency is no longer there, that you can't build a, a doctrinal practice on, on the basis of what might be necessary in a genuine emergency. And we just need to, I, I think, clean up our language there. And when we have people making that, that kind of argument, well, we have these emergency, well, this is really not an emergency situation that we're talking about. There are a number of other uh, things that Sasa does in this uh, essay, I think, that are, are helpful. As I said, he comes back to the distinction of law and gospel, um, and that the preaching of the law is the alien work of the, of the office, uh, the gospel its proper work. He writes, the more seriously we take the immutable 
eternal divine commandments, the more we also know that the preaching of the law is not yet the final and highest thing that has been committed to us. The final and highest task of the office is this, that we lead penitent sinners to the one who is their savior because he has borne the sin of the world. And a bit later uh, in that same section, Zasa cites uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, where Paul uh, speaks of, uh, of how we have received this ministry of reconciliation and, um, and, and our ambassadors for Christ. And Sasa says this is precisely uh, the essence of the preaching office, that uh, we are there to deliver uh, the reconciliation uh, obtained by Christ. And so that the litmus test for any sermon uh, is that is, is, does the sermon uh, actually preach Jesus Christ and him crucified? Uh, and if the sermon is not uh, bringing penitent sinners uh, to the cross of Christ, he says it's not a Christian sermon. Or to paraphrase someone else um, uh, uh, who had made a kind of a similar statement, if it was not necessary for Jesus to die and be raised from the dead, uh, for this sermon to be preached, then you don't have a Christian sermon. In other words, if you, if you, could, if you have a religious speech that works whether or not Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead, you might have edifying speech or ethically enlightened proclamation, but you don't have a Christian sermon. The necessity always of, um, of, of the gospel. Sasa also notes uh, that uh, there is uh, that in the office, the preaching and teaching and administering the sacraments are inseparable. Uh, that uh, uh, again, the conjunction word in sacrament, uh, that there is a particular uh, order here. It's word and sacrament. Uh, Sasa. Uh, would not look kindly on liturgical innovations that begin a service with the sacrament and and end with a sermon. Uh, one of the suggestions made by uh, Dave and Barb Anderson in their uh, worship resource magazine for variety that this Sunday, let's start with the sacrament and move. To, no, that the preaching is always moving toward the Lord's body and blood and that the Lord's body and blood are not disconnected uh, from, from preaching. Without preaching, uh, the Lord's Supper can be mis will be misused. Uh, hence Luther's point uh, that we ought not come together unless there would be, be preaching. And, um, and, and, and that uh, the sacrament also keeps uh, the sermon from simply kind of evaporating into a generic religious uh, discourse. And, um, and, and Sasa says that in the liturgy, uh, we have a framework of, of, of uh, a framework that actually uh, guards and protects the sermon. So that even in cases where the sermon might be inadequate, uh, you have the proclamation of the gospel uh, in the historic liturgy. And he notes how this worked even in the Roman Mass, uh, that uh, with the Agnus Dei, and even uh, with the uh, canon of the Mass, which Luther and Sasa uh, both found objectionable, uh, you still had even embedded there in uh, the language of, of God not weighing our trespasses against us, uh, but looking only on the merits of, of Christ. And, and so the gospel, or the liturgy, in other words, provides framework and safeguard uh, for, uh, for, for, for preaching. Uh, Zasa emphasizes uh, that the office itself is one. It's singular. It's the predictum, the office of, 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 of preaching, and preaching in the broad sense, uh, as Zasa notes, includes the sacraments, and that any distinctions we make within the office are of human origin. And, and yet the singularity, uh, the oneness of the office uh, is, to be, uh, is, is to be guarded. Sasa observes that 
when it came to the office, Luther was engaged in a, in a two-sided battle, even as he was engaged in a two-sided battle on the Lord's Supper with uh, Rome and the enthusiast. Uh, so also he was engaged in a two-sided battle um, with Rome and the enthusiast over the office. Uh, that the office, Sasa argues, is not the office of sacrifice, priest. In fact, he notes that in the New Testament, the only time priest singular is used is in reference to Jesus Christ, the great high priest, and that Christians are certainly spoken of as members of a priesthood. Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, the minister is not referred to as, uh, as, as, as priest, and that in Lutheran, uh, in, in, in Lutheran theology, the office is not there to offer the fruits of, or to offer the sacrifice of the mass, but to distribute the sacrifices of Christ or the sacrifice of Christ in proclamation and in the distribution of the Lord's uh, body and, uh, uh, and, and, and blood. And, um, and then he has a, a brief, again, kind of a, a excursus on um, the relationship of the office uh, to the royal priesthood. Uh, the two are not put in opposition to one another. It's not a power play between those who are members of the priesthood and the royal priesthood and those who hold the office. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the gift of being in, in, in Christ's royal priesthood is uh, the gift that we are given in baptism and faith, and it is common uh, to all Christians. The office of the ministry, on the other hand, is an office that is there to serve the royal priesthood with the gifts which, in fact, enliven and enable them uh, to be the royal priesthood, uh, living the life of living of 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 a ongoing and living living sacrifice. So some good uh, material, I think, there, uh, particularly in the way of drawing some distinctions and clarifications uh, that often uh, that often get confused. And then finally, Sasa pulls this essay together uh, by noting how Lutherans take the lonely way, his language again, uh, between uh, Rome and fanaticism. Uh, Rome would see the office as an office of sacrifice, which is again uh, ordered so that you have a specific class of people who are empowered now to offer the sacrifice. Uh, fanaticism uh, would obliterate the office uh, in the way of then everyone becomes his own minister, his own pastor. Uh, the language of a 1974 book of Missouri Senate origin, Oscar Foyt, everyone a minister, uh, is, is really a, a quite a radical misreading of Luther uh, at, at, at this point. That, uh, uh, yeah, that, uh, you know, it's, it's like George Farrell used to say, when everything becomes sacramental, nothing is a sacrament. But when everything becomes, when everyone becomes a minister, uh, no one's a minister. And, and, uh, and, and fanaticism uh, would, uh, would see the spirit working directly uh, in the heart and in the lives of the believer apart from the external word. So Luther's confession of the office is always tied up with the external verb, the, the, the word, the sacraments, which are, are to be administered, and, 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 and Christ has committed that uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the men that he has called and ordained into the, uh, into the office. There's a, um, another essay uh, that Sasa writes that I'm going to point you, uh, uh, point you to in, in terms of the office of the ministry. Later essay, an essay he does 1968, so uh, toward um, the end of his life, he's uh, officially already in retirement, I think, by this time, but still, uh, still writing. Uh, it's on pages 335 to 372 of Lonely Way under the title, The Crises of the Christian Ministry. And again, uh, the timing here is, um, is significant. Uh, he's in Australia, but what is happening in Europe and in the USA 
1968. In Europe? What's that? Well, the war in Vietnam, right? Especially people. Yeah. Uh, in, in war in Vietnam and it's the Democratic, Democratic National Convention here, Chicago. And 1968 was the year of the student revolts in the German universities. And, um, and, and uh, this was, uh, was very traumatic to... Uh, the whole academic system in Germany. Uh, Helmut Tielke, uh tells of um, of being in a in a, cl a classroom in a lecture hall in Hamburg, and students just rushed in and disrupted the lecture, and um, and this happened all over. In fact, Tilika had a nervous breakdown and uh, over that, and never really completely recovered. Uh, so it was just a overturning, uh, you know, question authority. And this was bleeding over in the 60s, of course, into the church too. And, um, and, and so uh, you had popular religious journalists uh, writing about the crises of the ministry. Uh, Clyde Reed did a book, The Empty Pulpit, during that period. You remember that? And uh, Rural Howell was suggesting that in the miracle of dialogue, that you would no longer have sermons, uh, but just kind of groups for, you know, dialogue. Everything was going to be made in this kind of egalitarian way. It's no accident that during this time also the push for women's ordination would come. I'm going to talk more about Sasa uh, on women's ordination and his diagnosis of that um, yet today after probably after lunch. But um, um, but the this brought about, uh, I think, and I, I mean, I was still in high school and I, and so was kind of insulated down in Catawba County from, uh, from, from all of this. But, um, as I went to college and seminary and started, you know, reading and taking classes at seminary in pastoral theology, uh, you had a new genre of pastoral care literature. And it typically went in the way of pastor as administrator, leader, or pastor as therapist. And um, when I was at Westville House a number of years ago, I heard a quaint British expression, which I used in an anniversary of ordination sermon two weeks ago. Uh, if you really want to insult somebody, you're as worthless as a clergyman. Because what do the clergy do? They hatch, match, and dispatch. They baptize, they uh, marry, and they bury. And and so basically, the clergy, and you think of the you know, Church of England situation, uh, they have a, kind of a decorative function. Nice to have the old chap show up, but he really just has you know sips tea with old ladies. And you're not sure about his sexuality or his gender, kind of ministers third sex. Uh, that there, that there, there's, that there's, there's, that that they're really, uh, you know, they're really kind of worthless. They don't do anything, and so there was this kind of agitation that we need to make sure that ministers are actually relevant, uh, that they are not just ceremonial chaplains but that they actually are productive. And so one way this happened in the 60s was the whole movement toward a uh, pastor as counselor. And the uh, pastoral care literature uh, that would uh, emanate uh, Howard Klein bill, uh, basic types of pastoral care. Uh, uh, you found kind of theological grounding for this in Paul Tillich's method of correlation, that uh, theology needs to learn to speak the language of psychology, and um, and and so uh, so, who is the pastor? What is the pastor there to do? Uh, that it's would considered lame to talk about the pastor as preacher because nobody wants to be preached to anymore, or or the authority of the pastor. 
Department of Ministry or pastors administering sacraments. That's just kind of a quaint liturgical notion. We can all stand in a circle and, and sing. They all know we are Christians by our love, and we can pass out potato chips and Kool-Aid as a more relevant community building kind of sacrament, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, but if you didn't know the way of pastor as counselor, you go away as pastor, as kind of administrator. One of the books we used in uh, pastoral theology when I was at Trinity Seminary in Columbus in the mid-70s uh, was a book by James Glass, mi mi uh, Profession Minister. And it was all about how the pastor needs to be a professional. And that means the pastor has to have particular academic credentials. He needs to you know, keep office hours. He needs to develop space for his own life. Uh, and, and, and the pastor is basically then seen as kind of a, a profession, which interestingly enough is the way that Schleimacher attempted to provide space for theology at the University of Berlin uh, in the uh, early 1800s, that we're going to make the theology faculty no longer the queen of the sciences, but at least it can have a professional place. And, um, and so the theology faculty uh, gets put alongside the faculty of law and the faculty of medicine because these are uh, disciplines that are training professionals. I mean, if you really want to read something on church leadership, uh, read Schleimacher's introduction uh, to uh, practical theology, that it's, it's all about church leadership. And um, uh, again, I think some of our gurus in you know, a church leadership, they haven't read much Schleimacher uh, and maybe wouldn't, it wouldn't matter to them that, that this has actually been tried by, and who had tried it in the past. But this whole kind of movement to identify a pastoral office as a professional, either leadership or therapy. Yeah. I was just going to say in the Southeastern District, they, that that's the, the heavy emphasis there. We're not even allowed to have pastors conferences anymore. It's yeah. all professional church workers yeah. conferences. I mean, they literally have done away with any anything with the pastor pastoral offering of pastoral office. But if you are in professional church work, yeah, then yeah. it doesn't matter who, yeah. who who wants to come to the yeah. It's and that's very much how they they approach these. Yeah. Well, please making noise. Um, yeah, and, and, and again, just the, the way we, what we name a thing actually then begins to determine how we think about it. And, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and so, you know, if you control the language of naming, then you have the power. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, God knew what he was doing when he told, you know, Adam to name the creatures. <laughs> but but there's a negative side of that when we then name the thing. And we can't then like Luther call a thing what it is. Uh and and we call it something, you know, uh something else. Yeah. Uh, well, at any rate, Sasa, this is the context in which Sasa is writing, writing in Australia, but uh, by this time Australia is not that far behind the rest of, you know, kind of North American Western. Uh, world when it comes to these issues. So Sasa says, when we talk about the crises of the ministry, and he's picking up on that language that was so common uh, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, that we have to make again a distinction. He says, there is a crisis that belongs to the nature of the office itself. And then there is the crisis, which is conditioned by the church in a certain age. The real crisis, the crises of the office itself, Sasa opines, uh, is seen in the fact that God demands from his servants something which is humanly speaking impossible. Uh, and then Sasa gives examples, Moses and Jeremiah from the Old Testament, uh, you think of Moses' complaint when the Lord calls him to go to Pharaoh. Uh, I don't 
do very well with public speaking. Yeah. Or Jeremiah, I'm only a youth. Or in the New Testament, uh, Paul, with uh, the confession that he is chief of sinners, uh, and with a nagging thorn in the flesh that is never alleviated. Um, and, and yet, thus says, you know, Paul, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Or the prophets, this burning of the word of God in the bones that they cannot help but prophesy. Uh, Sasa says this is the real crises of the ministry is that God bids his servants do that which is, humanly speaking, impossible. To speak a word which creates faith. Uh, not to argue people into the kingdom or by means of their own intellectual uh, devices find a better and new way, but simply to trust the word which has been given them and to speak. So, uh, uh, so Sasa says, this is the real crisis of the ministry. No one can understand uh, the ministry of the word, he says, who has not understood why the Old Testament called the word a burden. And he does this nice little uh, kind of walk through here of some Old Testament literature uh, where the prophets would rather not prophesy. Uh, they would rather cast the burden away, retreat like Jonah, uh, do something else, uh, go in for some career counseling, uh, find a, uh, you know, a better profession. And yet it finally comes down, Sasa says, uh, to the words of the apostle in 1 Corinthians uh, 9, uh, 16, necessity is laid upon me. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. And so the task of the office is to preach the word given in the prophetic and apostolic writings, uh, that the minister is in fact a servant of this word. Uh, speaking of, the, of the, uh, the task of the office then, uh, to preach the, uh, the prophetic and apostolic uh, word. Uh, and again, one of the things I appreciate about Sasa, and we'll see this when it comes to questions also of church fellowship, he doesn't typically give you kind of a straight out bang, bang, bang answer. He works with you theologically to get you to the right place. And, um, and that's what he's doing here. I mean, he's, he just doesn't pick up on the language of crisis and get into this kind of a clerical pity party, ain't it awful that everything is so bad for us pastors. He goes back to the scriptures and he works through what the real crisis of the office is. And so he doesn't say a whole lot um, about kind of contemporary issues until he comes to the end of the essay. And then he doesn't say a whole lot about contemporary issues, but he's really addressed them by taking his readers um, back to the um, uh, back to the scriptures, and and so uh, the task of the office is to preach the word as it's given by the prophetic and apostolic scriptures. The crisis of the ministry is rooted in the fact that God uses sinners as His servants. He writes, "This contradiction disappears, and the crisis is resolved only." where it is understood that the missio pectorum, the sending of sinners, and the remissio pectorum, the forgiveness of sins, are two aspects of the one grace of God. That God sends sinners to forgive sins. He uses uh, the sinners who have been forgiven. Uh, think again, John 20, uh, the apostles, uh, did not put themselves in that office by their own stellar performance on, in Holy Week. You know, uh, they were failures. Uh, they received the forgiveness of sins in Christ 
first word of peace, and with the second word of peace, they are sent. And, and Zasa says two sides, same reality, uh, forgiveness of sins, and those who have been forgiven are here sent uh, to forgive, uh, to forgive uh, sins. Uh, the um, crisis of the ministry, Sasa argues, therefore is inherent in the office itself, that we ought not think of this time condition crisis as somehow unique. And so he goes back to the New Testament, to the early church. He says, the first crises, time condition crises in the ministry came with the death of the apostles. Now, uh, those who were sent by the Lord Jesus, John 20, are dying off or have all died off. Has the ministry ended with them? Or is the apostolic ministry to continue? And if so, uh, how? He says another threat to the ministry came um, when Christianity was being endangered with being absorbed by pagan syncretism and a rising Gnostic movement, uh, which was made more complicated, he argues, with emerging heresies, when it was becoming difficult to distinguish truth from falsehood. The he discusses the office of the bishop and uh, here, you know, uh, repeats what we have from uh, Irenaeus, for example, on, on the canon, regular fide, and the, bish uh, the office of bishop, um, but notes that genuine apostolic succession was not guaranteed by the right hands, but by the right teaching. That genuine apostolic succession is not determined by liturgical pedigree, but by continuity with the apostles' doctrine. And so the office of bishop is not, even he, in, in Irenaeus, is not standalone. It is always joined with the regula fide, the rule of faith, and with the, the, the canon. He has a um, helpful and extended kind of almost excursus midway through the essay on the relationship of the inspiration of scripture uh, to the canon. And he notes that where there is prophecy, there is also false prophecy. And at all times, the number of false prophets has been greater than the true prophets of God. He says this was already the case during the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and it would continue in uh, the life of the Christian church as, 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 as well. And uh, canon uh, was, it is not that the canon makes the scripture, but the canon confesses that these inspired writings are indeed the word of God and rule, norm, to use the language of the formula, uh, normative, uh, for the proclamation uh, of God's word in the church. Sasa sees the contemporary crisis of the office as one of the truthfulness of the gospel. In other words, do we believe the gospel actually is the power of God unto salvation and so proclaim it? Or do we put our trust elsewhere in technique, in method, uh, in um, in, in some other standard, uh, or, uh, or, or do we actually trust the word of God uh, to do what Christ uh, intends to do through that word? He calls then his readers back to what is central. The proper work of the office is the dispensation of the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Sasser writes on page 371, for the hands of the minister and the words he speaks uh, are the words of Christ, or the or, or excuse me, for the hands of the minister and the words he spoke were the hands of Christ and the words of Christ. 
there uh, recalling Luther's language that when you hear your pastor speak, you recognizing you recognizes you recognize that this is the voice of you know Larry Peters or or Phil Johnson, but it's actually the voice from heaven, the voice of Christ. You see the hand dip into the font. It's the hand of the pastor, you know, but it's actually the hand, uh, hand of God. That the whole understanding of office and the confessions, the pastor um, standing in the stead of Christ, representing Christ, not that the pastor somehow becomes Christ, but the pastor is the human instrument that God uses uh, to do his work. And so it's finally not the preaching of a man, but the preaching of Christ. It's not the baptism of a man, it's the baptism of Christ. It's not the absolution of a man, absolution of, of, of Christ, and, and not, the, uh, not the, uh, uh, the body and blood of a man, but uh, the body and blood of Christ that are given. And then he notes that church administration dare not become an end in itself. He repeats what he had said 20-some years earlier in the um, essay that we looked at uh, uh, right off this morning on the Office of the Ministry about uh, external church government, internal church government. He really just kind of recapitulates that a bit. And that when we talk about church, you know, the, the language now in the 1960s uh, is the language of church administration. And that, of course, continues today. And, and, and uh, the real church administration is the administration of the gospel and the sacraments. External church administration makes space for the real administration of the church preaching and sacraments uh, uh, to occur. And, and, um, uh, and, and so Sasa uh, kind of comes back and, and reiterates that. He concludes the, um, the essay with uh, words of encouragement and promise. God has himself provided a solution to the crises of the ministry, and that is to be found in Isaiah 55, 11. Familiar passage, the word of God does not return to him empty or void, uh, but accomplishes the purpose for which he sent it. Uh, Sasa's point is that pa the, the real crisis of, of the ministry is only resolved as those who are in the office have the confidence that the words they are speaking are Christ's words. He also includes some kind of side comments in the essay about Bultmanianism and the fact that you have pastors who have uh, bought into uh, this uh, rejection of the truthfulness of Holy Scripture and so that they are not confident that what they are preaching is true. Uh, and he mentions uh, you know, a young pastor in Germany and a suburban congregation uh, who stands up on Easter Sunday and cannot with good conscience say that Christ is risen. Uh, he says, well, you know, you take away the content, you take away the, the, the truthfulness of the scripture, uh, obviously you're going to have a crisis because then what do you, you know, what do you proclaim in the way of 1 Corinthians, you know, 15? And, 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 uh, and, 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 and that we need uh, pastors who believe the truth of the gospel and then are not afraid to stand behind that gospel or to use Luther's language, stand in front of the text and actually proclaim it and, and, and trust that the word of God will do the work uh, that he intends that word uh, uh, to do. So in many ways, this, uh, this little essay from 1968, uh, especially when you think about the context when uh, Sasa was writing, uh, the, um, is, 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 um, very pointed and and uh, and continues, I think, to be uh, of service to us so that we are encouraged and uh, do not grow weary or lose heart, to use the language of Paul in 2 Corinthians, but understanding that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, uh, proclaim, uh, 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 proclaim uh, uh, Christ. Uh, other comments here on... Uh, on, on this particular essay or on Sasa's understanding of the office in general. I do want to move into uh, two essays that Sasa wrote uh, on women's ordination. 
because I think both of those again are are quite timely and uh, and and helpful to uh, uh, to take a look at uh, uh, today. But we'll we'll pick that up after lunch. So any uh, any any questions here? Comes almost close to the uh, to the um, to the ancient heresy that uh, the effectiveness of the means of grace are dependent upon the the faith and uh, of the pastor maybe not his character mm-hmm. maybe not his righteousness but uh, but on his conviction of the he speaks so faith. passionately yes yeah. he, spe- he speaks so passionately yeah. in that regard i understand it from the context yeah. of the time yeah but um but it almost at times sounds as if if the pastor doesn't believe what he says then the word won't do what it's yeah yeah. What it promises. What will he preach if he doesn't believe is he's, what he's yeah. asked. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, uh, as is often the case in uh, in, in theology, uh, oftentimes we all move right up onto the kind of the precipice of, of heresy. It's like Paul in Romans. Uh, if you read no further than the end of Romans 5, you would think that Paul is uh, completely antinomian. I mean, you have to preach the gospel with such force that uh, you raise a suspicion of antinomianism, and 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 then baptismally, Paul addresses the continuing place of the law in the life of 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 the Christian. Uh, Sasa again. I mean, he he's writing. I mean, I I don't think he is uh, you know uh, kind of a semi Donatist. He brings up a dimension that I think is still in, in, important. While it's not the faith of the minister that is the foundation of the office or the foundation of the efficacy of his word, uh, nevertheless, those who are put in the office are to be you know, examined to ascertain that they are holding with a good conscience this this faith. The whole language of the pastoral, you know, pastoral epistles. I think Sasa is just addressing kind of a real practical thing. I mean, if you go to, uh, if if you go to a, a, a sermon that is preached by a pastor who himself is not a believer, uh, and and parades his doubts in the pulpit, you know, uh, and talks about uh, how the text, uh, you know, uh, apologizes for the text rather than preaches the text or tries to lead people behind the text to see, well, this is what the Bible says, but I don't think it happened like this. Well, you know, that is gonna undercut the, the, the confidence of the hearers in, in, in the apostolic message, which is, is proclaimed. I think that's what Sasa is getting at here with he, he, when he you know, makes these references about Bultman, young Boltmanian preachers in Germany and that sort of thing, yeah. You know, in his essay on um, on evangelism, he talks about you can't call people to baptism if you don't believe in the washing of regeneration. Right. Um, so I wonder, are we admitting people to the office who don't believe in uh, private confession and absolution, who don't believe that the historic liturgy, uh, safe, as you said, as Sasha said, proclaims uh, uh, safeguards and mm-hmm. really establishes the the gospel. Uh, who don't believe in hymnody and the church here as proclaiming, preserving and proclaiming the gospel. Um, what what are we going to end up preaching? Mm-hmm. What, what kind of church are we going to have? Mm-hmm. If, if the ministry itself has no conviction about these things, mm-hmm. if they're considered adiaphora. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't, that this is really. It will become a sect. Very will sect. Have to really die. Which There's is no one of the dangers to what we have seen unfold with the barn door being open with so many laity getting into the office of public ministry without even understanding mm-hmm. the importance of those very issues that he mm-hmm. brought up. Well, quite frankly, without understanding the importance of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. therefore are not, it, we, therefore not understanding what their whole role is mm-hmm. to proclaim Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead, they're proclaiming organization. They're proclaiming um, therapy, they're proclaiming feeling better, um, God is with me, 
in, in my precious moments and devotions with him, mm -hmm. pietism, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. but they're not proclaiming Christ for sinners. And that, yeah, I, I, to kind of get back to Paul's point, I think we need to push behind those issues. Because if you simply kind of zero in on, on the on the on the issue, there are symptoms. Of, yeah, symptoms of something else. And um, my suggestion is, that with Kononia Project, that we need to start more, much more basically with the question: What is the gospel? See, I think we have a number of different understandings of what the gospel is going on. And unless we are in agreement with what the gospel is, uh, seven again. Uh, we're going to be all over the place with these other issues and we'll be not even able to, we, we won't even be able to carry on a conversation because we're using this word gospel in, in different, different ways. And, 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 and that's, you know, that's more scary for people because it's, uh, it, it's more comforting to think that we have this great unanimity in doctrine and belief uh, and uh, and that we just have some relatively minor disagreements, you know, over and against practice. And I, I think we need to be honest with one another in the conversation and say that, you know, we, we may have different understandings of the gospel here. Well, it shows up very clearly when you start thinking, when you start asking the question, what is mission? Right. Well, there's your litmus test. Mm -hmm. If your mission is to grow the church, Mm -hmm. You have a different mission than to proclaim the gospel to sinners, right? So they're they're exactly I mean, that's that those are two different missions, mm -hmm. two different, well, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, both at work, yeah. So <laughs> Paul stands up in the in the portico of Solomon at the temple, and we're amazed that two or three thousand people believed that day, mm -hmm. but that's supposedly Pentecost when there were what two hundred thousand, a yeah. million people there at the temple in and out. Yeah. And only that many believe. Yeah. Those people who knew the Old Testament in and out and only 2000 of them believed. Yeah. That many rejected him. Yeah. Let's, I, I, I love I, I hate focusing on the rejection and that we're beat up all the time. But but, you know, let's keep in mind that this is something that we do have to uh, keep at. Mm -hmm. Sasa is just so wonderful to build this up. Yeah. And uh, again, we're not really working with this little evangelism essay much here, but it parallels us, and especially his part our, on what you know what is really the power behind the evangelism. It's 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 the gospel, and yeah. The question then lies in as well pertaining to the seminaries, mm -hmm. because um, I know with my own experience in, in my circuit. There's, there's sort of these generational gaps between myself and pastors who mm -hmm. were at different seminaries at different times and so forth. And there are different interpretations of how they will proceed to talk to me about what the gospel is mm -hmm. and, and where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, the way I've kind of approached that is what's been what's been done has been done and what's been taught has been been taught. But mm -hmm. how, how, how with the seminaries, is there a, is there a unified approach to this idea that uh, both institutions are sending out, you know, men who who look at anything from mission to gospel mm -hmm. to however it is in a unified sense, not this idea of mm -hmm. well, we we kind of are fractured and have our different opinions and views because we had different teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wish they could give a a clear cut answer to that. I mean, uh, you've got, uh, I mean, uh, you. Um, you wonder sometimes when you have some of the, I mean, I'm thinking about some of the older brothers who had some pretty good teachers and they still, you know, I mean, even in Sasa's case, I mean, uh, Sasa had, uh, some of Sasa's students have strayed pretty far from where, from what Sasa taught, which is encouragement for me because you can never uh, finally control what your students, you know, what your students you do you you try to teach as clearly and equip them the best uh, you can and and the prayer of a theological professor as indeed the prayer of every christian is lord keep us steadfast in thy word uh and and that we are 
you know, we are coming, as Luther said, as beggars before God, uh, imploring him to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, that is to keep us steadfast. And I don't want to say much more about that now because I'm going to try to preach on that maybe tomorrow morning. But when you look again at the history of the church, it's not that those who would go off in errant directions did not necessarily have good teachers. To also with seminaries, you know, and, and I think you can sympathize with this and keep this in mind, that uh, we, we have guys coming to the seminaries, both seminaries from all kinds of different backgrounds, uh, you have, uh, which is to be expected, and that's you know, the way it is. Um, and, and you have some who are teachable, uh, you have some who kind of develop the cooperate and graduate mentality and, um, and, and seem to be oblivious to what they've been taught. And then they go out in the congregation and kind of do whatever they're going to uh, do. I mean, there are no fail safe, you know, methods, uh, uh, methods there. Uh, the, other, the other thing I think too, is in, in, important, and that's the reason I'm, I mean, I'm glad you guys are here for a class like this. But a lot of, I find a, a lot of guys too in circuits who are actually teachable and winnable, but they just need brother pastors to take the time to do it. And um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the difficulties I see sometimes in our uh, synod today is that uh, you have guys who are solid and are orthodox, and rather than taking a guy who is not quite there yet and leading him in the right direction, we kind of set the bar up here, and I'm not going to have anything to do with him until he's... And, and then you wonder, when why do they get pushed into the other camp? Well, it's pretty... To me, it's pretty obvious. And, and that we need, again, to trust the Word of God to do its work and not to be ashamed to, to confess to those... Uh, to those brothers who are struggling or even who are errant. And so we, we do what we can do.